Spencer asked me to talk about three things, I guess, if I've got it right. One is kind of the natural forest management picture overall. The second is what Ecotrust Forest does with its land and intends to do. And uh, then to try to put that in the context that he talked about last night of a post-petroleum economy. And actually, on the natural forest management front, in general, I'd start kind of with Charlie's premise that things are kind of all connected together. And I know that's sort of a leftover 70s buzz phrase, but it's turning out to be true, and uh, truer than we know in a lot of places. So that uh, keeping forests as forests, for me, is the number one conservation goal on Earth. Forests are unique in several respects when compared with other communities, whether they're grasslands or oceans or deserts. One is that they fix more carbon per acre. They take more carbon out of the air per acre than any other kind of system. Uh, and that's true across all kinds of forests. The second one is they're the greatest reservoirs of biological diversity on Earth. And we often talk about forests as kind of biological diversity hamburger helper. Like, well, you gotta have old growth forests to have owls. You gotta have old growth forests to have salmon. And that's true. But I think it's kind of a bad rap on forests. Old large trees by themselves and in aggregate are biodiversity on their own. They're a kind of life form that when you look at them and think about it, may even be more striking than the little salmon you just saw coming up in the pool. So that I think when we think about forests, we need to think about them in the context of how do we keep them and how do we have more of the older, larger, diverse kind that seem to be what most people like. And opinion survey after opinion survey, country after country, you ask people what they like about forests. They like big trees, spaced, probably some stuff under them, but not a whole lot. And they like to see animals in there. So if you know, we take that in, in the large sense, uh, and the animals including the fish in the stream, then keeping forests is a good idea. So how do we do that? Well, one way is to make preserves. Uh, when I went to Yale, I found out Yale had a system of natural preserves. And I thought that meant strawberry jam when I went there. It was not, uh, but there were little bitty places where they were gonna let nature take its course. And that's fine. But if you look at the forests of the world, the chance that any significant fraction of them, and I think the UNEP goal was 10%, should be turned into reserves is probably utopian. That is, reserves where human influence is kept to a minimum. There's no commercial purpose. So how do we keep the rest of those for us? And how do we keep them functional as old, diverse, biological diversity bearing, pleasant, some of the time, places to be? Well, I think it's only by managing them. And I think to say a wor world creeping up on 8 billion people, to say, well, we'll just let nature do it, is a cop-out. We're going to have to declare ourselves part of nature and work to see that we keep and create forests of that kind. And that's true whether you're talking about rainforests of the Amazon, which in my view are greatly overpraised as the big old forests. I think ours are better in a number of respects, but that's a side issue. Uh, the way to keep them is to make incentives for people to want to keep them and put them in that condition. Well, what are incentives for people? Doing good. We all want to do good. But I don't think that's enough, because we've had a lot of people wanting to do good about forests for a long time. And this brings us to Ecotrust, and, a, and a, perhaps a contentious assertion. Unless we can have that kind of forest, the diverse, large old tree, salmon-friendly kind of forest, and make money with it, we're not gonna have very many of them in the face of population pressure and the fight for commodities that's going on all over the globe now. So we're gonna to have to learn how to manage those for us so we get those values and there's a financial incentive for people to own them. And that's Spencer's vision. And I, I think Leif and his crew have showed us today that it's an achievable one. We've got a ways to go. But I think uh, that kind of management uh, is necessary if we're going to have forests in the world of the kind we like. 
That's not to say there won't be other kinds. There'll be plantations. There'll be very intensive culture systems, whether they're for pecans or wood or grapes, for that matter, or perennial woody plants. But if we want the forest, we're going to have to do it this way because I think wood is going to be around as something we can sell and use and should be for a long time. Now we've talked about the management strategies and in our car at least we've talked a lot about the need to make the management strategies fit the exact place where they're being applied not big blanket prescriptions that uh, very often work one place but not another place. And that's what Ecotrust Forest is pioneering. Now, trees are interesting in several respects, and I'll get to the quiz here in a minute. I haven't forgotten that, so think about your numbers. Um, one of the most interesting ones is that they write their own record, which is pretty irrefutable in tree rings that you can see with the naked eye. And we looked at this piece a little bit up on the landing and, and when we were looking at uh, the no man's land that Plum Creek created there. As you can see, and I'll, I'll pass this around the class, that these trees grew pretty well for their first 30 years or so and then slowed down markedly. Now if we want big old trees, as soon as we can get them, to have old growth character and to be able to slide down the hill and block up the creek like we saw around the corner, then getting them bigger faster is better. And by thinning, we can avoid this growth slowdown and keep them growing so they get big, uh, at least in some of our lifetime. So to me, that's the overriding goal of Ecotrust for us. And I love the idea that it's driven, connected by salmonids, fish, Garth Voigt, who was a kind of a legendary soils teacher at Yale, used to say, you only need to know one thing about your forest management. If the water coming off your land supports a healthy population of trout, he said, he was a fly fisherman, uh, then you're probably doing it right. And I, I'll, as a forester, I'll buy that. I don't think that's bad. So that's where I think Ecotrust Forest is trying to go. Now, post petroleum economy. Uh, what's the largest source of potential energy on Earth today? You got it. Every day enough comes in to keep us for a long time. We just don't catch it very well. So we use fossil energy, the kind Spencer was talking about. I think we need to move to a current solar economy. Right now, the best bet for that is right there. It's letting photosynthesis make plants, and particularly parts of plants that store themselves and do other things that are good for us. And that's wood. So um, we need to start looking, I think, at our forests as solar transducers places that transform solar energy and then we get to decide and direct that solar energy into what we want. We want some of it in the salmon, we want some of it on the land, we want some of it in the car or in the house. But that's our limiting factor. What can we do with that solar income, in our case using for us, to create the array of goods and values that we want? I think when we start looking at things that way, a lot of the conflicts disappear. For one thing, there's no free lunch. You can't have more than that. That's the bad news. The good news is there's a heck of a lot of that. And if we learn to manage it and direct it, we'll live happily ever after. <laughs>